Ambassador Doa won three consecutive elections as Premier of Manitoba with an unprecedented successive increase of majority. That's, that says uh, a lot in itself. So in 2005, he was named by Business Week magazine as one of the top 20 international leaders in climate change. His government introduced balanced budgets during each of his 10 years in office while reducing many taxes, including a plan to eliminate small business tax. As Premier, he's led strategic investments in healthcare, education, training, and infrastructure. Ambassador Doa hails from Winnipeg and is married with two daughters, and it is our sincere delight to, to welcome him as our keynote speaker for our 26th symposium. would be energy efficiency and we worked with the United States uh, to have common energy efficiency standards for light vehicles and for heavy uh, uh, on uh, ocean bear uh, ocean ships uh, uh, that we would uh, be working with uh, in our ports uh, to develop a conditioning standard in the United States and it, we need air conditioning in Canada by the, way, by the way you may not believe that but Canada we align those regulations to have both the energy efficiency and the trade that would go from uh, our three countries because those energy efficiency standards don't get a lot of publicity uh, but they've also contributed to the fact that Canada and the United States are selling a lot more cars that are domestically produced standards that will continue uh, to be part of our uh, transportation strategy. Now a lot of people don't know Geez, it's the cars we drive. They always show on TV a great big, you know, uh, belching factory or something else as, as an image. And really, it's everything uh, that we drive, uh, trucks and, and vehicles, it's the number one uh, issue to develop. Now, this is very much part of our Copenhagen agreement with the U.S., which we think is doable. Uh, we think it's doable over time because we want all countries to be eventually in 16 countries that to, do, to reduce ozone depleting and in the uh, Montreal Protocol is about 165 countries that are in. So we believe energy efficiency is number one. Number two is renewables. Uh, we're developing renewables in Canada. You are developing renewables, I know, in Texas with wind and, uh, and some other renewables. Texas was the largest consumer on a per capita basis of Crown Royal whiskey made in my country. <laughs> two-way trade example and my only difficulty along with Paula now on energy is it's easier to get Crown Royal in a pipeline to Texas than it is oil. So we're, we're, we're working on it. We're working on it here in, in Texas. Um, we, uh, it's great, as I say, it's great to be here today and I enjoyed the panel. I just uh, was able to see in, in uh, General Electric and I didn't know this number, but he indicated to us he believe we have a similar problem with Canada, United States, and Mexico. So we signed these communiques dealing with renewable energy and transmission. The only problem is in both countries, and no disrespect, ever since that war, we have been allies uh, as well as trading partners. And uh, uh, they, you know, we've worked together on Libya just recently. Uh, there's military personnel from Texas and Canada. Uh, as we speak uh, in Afghanistan, transitioning in that situation. Uh, we work, uh, we're working together on uh, Iran uh, with massive sanctions to try uh, to hold Iran accountable to, to eliminate their capacity uh, to build nuclear weapons. And we totally concur with the United States uh, that containment after the fact is not an option and all options have to be on the table. Uh, to deal with these negotiations that are going on. So uh, we're very much uh, together and spending a lot of time together as, as you would expect as allies. World War I, World War II, the Korean War, we just celebrated the commemoration of the armistice that just took place. And uh, we spent a lot of time in, in Toluca and Mexico on the Ukraine. And of course, just two weeks later, uh, we had the invasion of how to cash the ticket. And we have to continue uh, to find ways to develop and articulate uh, an energy vision that goes beyond the one-trick ponies 
that are always debating in Washington or Ottawa or Mexico City, we got to get beyond that because a good energy independent strategy, in our view, in Canada, uh, is also uh, has, has a lot of attributes uh, for cleaner air and therefore believe that we should incorporate all of these together in a vision uh, and a plan of action uh, to have energy independence in uh, our neighborhood of North America. We would see that having four fundamental elements. Uh, number one would be energy efficiency. And we worked with the United States uh, to have common energy efficiency standards for light vehicles and for heavy ocean ships uh, uh, that we would uh, be working with uh, in our ports uh, to develop air conditioning standard in the United States. And in air, we need air conditioning in Canada, by the, by the way. You may not believe that, but air conditioning standard in Canada, we align those regulations to have both the energy efficiency and the trade uh, that would go from uh, our three countries. Because those energy efficiency standards don't get a lot of publicity, uh, but they've also contributed to the fact that Canada and the United States are selling a lot more cars that are domestically produced standards that will continue uh, to be part of our uh, transportation strategy. Now a lot of people don't know that uh, the largest source of GHGs is the cars we drive. They always show on TV a great big, you know, uh, belching factory or something else as, as an image and really it's everything uh, that we drive, the trucks and, and vehicles, it's the number one uh, issue to develop. Now this is very much part of our Copenhagen agreement with the U.S., which we think is doable. Uh, we think it's doable over time because we want all countries to be eventually in an uh, international agreement. We actually had an agreement called the Montreal Protocol that President Reagan and Prime Minister Mulroney were part of with 16 countries that to, do, to reduce ozone depleting material and it's actually reduced uh, GHGs more than Kyoto. Why? Because very few countries were in Kyoto, and in the uh, Montreal Protocol is about 165 countries that are in. So we believe energy efficiency is number one. Number two is renewables. Uh, we're developing renewables in Canada. You are developing renewables, I know, in Texas with wind and, uh, and some other renewables. In the U.S., the Canada uh, produces 63% of our electricity is produced by renewable energy. But I was just at a meeting a couple of days ago with Jeff Immelt from uh, General Electric, and I didn't know this number, but he indicated to us that it sometimes takes up to eight years to get a transmission line approved uh, from one state to another in the United States. And we believe we have a similar problem with Canada, United States, and Mexico. So we signed these communiques dealing with renewable energy and transmission. The only problem is in both countries, and no disrespect to any lawyers in this room, but I found when I was premier, there was one lawyer per megawatt to get anything approved. And we, you know, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he got rid of a coal plant in San Diego and was going to displace it with uh, solar energy from the desert, everybody applauded on Monday and then started to oppose the transmission line on Tuesday. And so we got to put these things together in a broader policy, uh, in a broader strategy, and, and I believe uh, uh, we can do that. I should point out in Canada, we have now passed a law that requires all of these projects with federal and provincial approval uh, to be dealt with in a two-year time period. Capital needs predictability. The public needs to know the environmental uh, impact and the economic benefits up front. But we just don't want to continue to see this drifting, dithering uh, process of approvals in our country. And we are very pleased that we've passed that. I understand uh, Governor Perry is aware of that and a number of other governors in the United States are very aware of this new law that we passed. There was a lot on gas in Canada and in the United States and Mexico, uh, or United States rather, uh, uh, with the uh, previous panel. I heard uh, Mr. Jenkins from British Columbia talking about what they were doing in full transparency, full accountability, the challenges on uh, developing natural gas with the uh, public uh, is issues. Uh, I'm one of these people that believe you've got to get out way early on 
to define and paint the canvas on the development of natural gas and shale gas in both Canada and the United States. It is interesting, as he pointed out on the panel, that the way our energy relationship is supposed to work in the Canada-US trade agreement, it's supposed to be on the basis of commercial access. So we had no difficulty approving a pipeline from Pennsylvania to Ontario to displace gas from Alberta because that was a better market decision for the consumers in Ontario as part of the Canada-US trade agreement. It didn't have uh, you know, a five-year protracted process that took place. But I do believe that we have to assure people over and over and over again about the safeguards to protect water. A and I also believe that we have to continue to spend time uh, to point out to the public of both Canada and the United States the tremendous economic benefits of having reliable, affordable, predictable gas that's available to start insourcing again uh, manufacturing jobs that have left that affordable energy and, and, and uh, intellectual property, I believe, will lead to more decisions to resource uh, jobs back in North America. And I believe that the, this is not something we can take for granted. We know the benefits, but we have to say it over and over and over again with the safeguards that are in place. Uh, there are people working tirelessly to stop us, uh, but it would be stopping progress uh, as the third element of an economic and uh, uh, energy strategy uh, for our neighborhood, for our neighborhood. Finally, in terms of uh, uh, this neighborhood, I believe oil uh, is uh, going to be required according to the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, U.S. will require some 34 percent of oil uh, from a so-called uh, so foreign source, which includes Canada and Mexico. We're very impressed with the kind of political leadership in Mexico with the amendment of the Constitution in, in both the uh, uh, legislative authorities in that country and the support of the governors uh, to proceed. This was very much part of the discussion in Toluca with the three leaders, the three amigos uh, from Canada, United States, and Mexico. Uh, and of course, here in Texas, we have Eagleford and the uh, other uh, basins that are being developed. Uh, in the United States, there's also Bakken oil, as we heard about on the panel uh, earlier on. Uh, Bakken oil is, exists in Canada. Uh, it exists in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, uh, in North Dakota and Montana. And the only thing we have to worry about is horizontal drilling under the uh, border uh, between our two countries uh, with that block of oil. And uh, we, uh, we haven't found a way to stop that uh, below the surface here, but it's very, very important. Uh, we, uh, we, we have said to the United States that we are willing to work with the states and provinces on uh, oil and gas regulations, but when people say Canada should go off on its own, why would you have one rule for gas in British Columbia and another rule in Pennsylvania? And why would you have one rule on in Saskatchewan on oil and in the Bakken and another rule in, in uh, Montana? So we think like light vehicles, uh, we should uh, it, it continue to work together uh, in a sustainable way. Ha having said that, uh, we, uh, we are, uh, should point out that people talk about oil from Canada and oil from the oil sands. The, the Keystone Pipeline that gets a little bit of controversy, uh, and I've heard I'm going to have a demonstration tomorrow. God, I miss those demonstrations. You know, I, I used to have them all the time when I was in politics. But the uh, one time I had the skinniest person in a polar bear. Now, we have polar bears in Manitoba, and they're really big. You need a really substantial person to wear a polar bear outfit if you're going to have a protest. And I would also point out, I would also point out, never, if you're ever in northern Canada, never give a polar bear a Coke, because they will eat you. Uh, they are very, very uh, much like that. But having said that, uh, we, uh, we, have, we have found a little controversy with the uh, uh, Keystone Pipeline, but you should know that oil is being developed in Canada. After the delay in Nebraska, oil still is coming down from Canada to the United States. Four years ago, we had 19% of the so-called foreign oil uh, coming down uh, from Canada. Now we're at 32%. Why? Because it's not coming down on new pipelines, it's coming down on rail. It's coming down on trains. The first year after the delay in Nebraska of the pipeline, a 48% increase in oil on rail. 
And I got good friends and, uh, with Burlington Northern and work in Manitoba, and I got to represent railways. But there was, it's another 50% increase this year with oil from rail. It's all coming down. The, the theory that the oil would stay in the ground if a pipeline's not built has fallen like a house of cards every day with every fact. And so when you look at the pipeline uh, that is being blocked by some people, and the southern route was just opened, by the way, so we have the missing link that we've got to get approved, uh, the situation is very simple. The State Department says that if the President and the State Department do not approve the Keystone Pipeline, it will come down on rail, and it will come down on trucks. In North Dakota, there's 500 trucks a day uh, transporting oil. Uh, uh, it's coming down on rail, and the State Department further states that rail has a higher cost, a higher risk of safety, public safety, and 28 to 42 percent <coughs> higher greenhouse gases than a pipeline. So when our Prime Minister says it's a no-brainer, in a diplomatic way, uh, <laughs> it is, in fact, lower cost, lower risk, and lower GHGs. So uh, we, have, we believe the arguments have been made, and we believe now the United States has an opportunity to proceed with the State Department factual report uh, and proceed with the pipeline because actually to say no is to say yes to higher greenhouse gases, even though that's the criteria the president said, has stated. So we're calling, a, you know, we, we're working now uh, to hire more veterans. We're working with the companies and the unions to have heart, uh, helmets to hard hats with returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. And so we just basically believe that uh, the, the president has the choice to choose hard hats over Hollywood celebrities, and I know some Hollywood celebrities, by the way. I, I was at a panel with a Hollywood celebrity whose name I won't mention, uh, but she did play the part of a mermaid in a movie, and she was in Copenhagen and said that uh, she has weaned herself completely off of all fossil fuels, which begs the question, how long is that kayak ride from Hollywood and Malibu uh, to Copenhagen? But we can choose, we can choose hard hats, over celebrities, we can choose Middle North America and Middle, uh, middle America over the Middle East, and, and we can choose uh, energy independence over energy dependence. And we would just say to everybody in the powers of be in Washington, if it's not snowing, go and watch Argo, go with Canada, and approve this pipeline. Thank you, Mayor.